Thing. So, yes, lots of pressure, but I love it though. I'm good. How are you? Well, you told me to come sit. I'm honestly surprised they want me to sing right now because it's, it's, you got your I got caught. Right? <laughs> kind of, yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, I got your bike. Huh? I got your bike. Oh, I got a little yeah. checklist. They were like, this past week it's better now. They were like, but I haven't here once. Yeah. I was like, I'm 15 minutes to make. You probably got it from here. Yeah. Oh, I know I do. Mm -hmm. My immune system is strong beginning of the year. I'll get better. Yeah. But I mean, I Hello. Good morning, Lamar Avenue. Let's stand and sing. It thrills my soul to hear the songs of praise we mortals sing below. And though it takes the parting of the ways, yet I must onward go. I hope to hear throughout a number of days the song earth cannot know. They sing and have not new song of Moses and the Lamb. Oh, to hear the angels singing, to bid me welcome to mansions bright and fair. Oh, to hear the glad hearts ringing with voices blaring, oh, rich and rare. I want to see. Oh, to see the Master bringing a precious life crown that I may own and wear. I want to hear. I want to hear that by. Sing, they sing, I want to hear the mighty chorus. Sing, they sing, to hear it swell and ring. The sweetest song that earth can ever boast was sung when Christ was born. Yet he Bright and fair. I want to oh, hear. to hear the glad ones ringing with voices blending rich and rare. I want to see. Oh, to see the master bringing a crown of life crown that I may own and wear. I want to hear. See, Jared's messed me up. But you also see I did not pull my shirt tail out. So I come up here, and the mic is not on this thing, but do you stand before the table or do you sit at the table? That's the question. Uh, we're glad you're here today, all of you. If you're visiting, we're really glad you're here, and we welcome you back at any time. Uh, there's a couple of things I want to remind us of. Uh, first of all, this Tuesday, uh, at 7 o'clock, 
uh, the men's breakfast uh, will be going on for all you guys, and John Cannon will be the speaker, so uh, you guys try to come out, and uh, you can eat really good, and uh, John will usually always be good, so come and hear that. Uh, another thing that I want to be sure everybody hears is if you got a link uh, uh, from an email or a text uh, to fill out a survey, we really need you to do that before midnight tonight. Um, I, th I think we told you maybe the ninth, uh, uh, and, and it still may be, but we'd like for you to do it tonight, before tonight if you could, so that we can begin to process that. And it's important, we wanna, we wanna hear from all of you. So if you can do that, try to do that before midnight tonight. Um, I wanna say, um, uh, I don't know if all of you realize it, but uh, uh, Jared is kind of all hands on deck right now. And so if y'all see him, thank him for uh, doing everything, including uh, the preaching. And he's still doing youth group, and he's still uh, teaching, and he's still uh, setting up everything for people that need it. He's still working with different groups to connect them and get the work done. So, uh, Jared, we're thankful for that. And... Uh, Hang in there, and if you need help, call us, and we'll tell you to just toughen up. Uh, or we might help you. So, um, I, think, I think that is, uh, uh, the last thing I would say is, uh, please be uh, in prayer and pray diligently as we search for uh, the right person to, to fit here and to help promote the gospel. Uh, we're going to be actively doing that now for a while, and we'll be reminding you uh, because uh, I, we, we just believe that praying for this is uh, a bigger part than the work that we're going to do. Uh, there are many in our numbers who, who are sick, and they're in this bulletin, and we want to always pray for them uh, and keep them in mind. I want to read a short passage uh, just to remind us. This is right after... Uh, Paul prays a prayer for the Ephesian uh, brothers. But I want to I wanna kind of remind us of this as we think about praying and, and, and searching uh, for a minister and for carrying out the work of God in Paris, Texas, and throughout the world. In Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20, he ends that chapter by saying, Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. So let's worship that God who has the power to get all this done and let's work with him as we try to do it. Let's stand. Can you hear? There's a new song breaking out from the children of freedom. Every race and every nation, sing it out, sing a new hallelujah. Let us sing love to the nations, bringing hope of the grace that has freed us. Make him known and make him famous. Sing it out, sing a new hallelujah. Arise, let the church
reaching out with a new hallelujah. Every son and every daughter, everyone sing a new hallelujah. Everyone sing a new Getting ready for that city When the saints go marching in Oh, when the saints go marching in When the saints go marching in Oh, Lord, I want to be in that number When the saints go marching in I'll follow my Redeemer in the steps where he has been. Thus I know that he will call me when the saints go marching in. Oh, when the saints go marching in. When the saints go marching in. Lord, I want to be in the number when the saints go marching in. Up there I'll see the Savior who redeemed my soul from sin. With extended hands he'll greet me when the saints go marching in oh when the saints go marching in when the saints go marching in oh lord i want to be in that number when the saints go marching in you may be seated let's prepare our minds get together with this next song. <laughs> the blood of Jesus speaks for me. Be still my soul, redeeming love. Out of the dust of Calvary is rising
blood of Jesus speaks for me. Worthy is the Lamb, Lamb for sinners slain, Jesus Lord of all, glory to his name. Heaven crying out, let the earth proclaim power in the blood, glory to his name, Jesus. Oh, let my soul arise and sing, my confidence is not in vain, the one who fights for me is king, his hope is covenant remain, no condemnation now I dread, eternal hope is mine instead, his word will stand, I stand. chapter 13, Jesus addresses his disciples, and he says, my children, I will only be with you a little longer. And then in chapter 14, he promises the Holy Spirit. He says, but I will ask my father and he will give to you another advocate to be with you until the end of time. Depending on which translation you read, the word advocate, originating from the Greek word paraclete, can be... Um, interpreted as comforter, counselor, or helper. But for our purpose this morning, I think advocate makes sense because advocate is a legal word. Um, Jesus is referring to the Holy Spirit here as our advocate. And um, if you were to be accused of a crime and stand before a jury or a judge on trial, <clears throat> you would hire a defense attorney and they would act as your advocate. And they don't just mediate on your behalf or advise you as to what to say. They speak for you. And if, if your advocate is seen to be brilliant and convincing and, and right, then you are pardoned. And the pardon doesn't go to your advocate. The pardon goes to you. And your attorney doesn't take the reward. <clears throat> it's passed on to you. And the same is true for us. Our advocate stands in our place and speaks on our behalf. Um, the theologian Charles Hodge once said, in the court of law, we disappear into our advocate. I think that's the perfect depiction of our relationship with Christ. We disappear into Jesus Christ because of what he's done on our behalf. But that's not the whole story. We're not just pardoned from death. Um, Jesus doesn't just grant us uh, forgiveness, we are, are also given life. And I think the best illustration that I've come across was just last week when John Piper spoke at a women's conference that I was not present at, but did watch online. And he said that there's no comparing the joy of walking out of prison after being wrongly imprisoned for 30 years with the joy of walking into the arms of your spouse after being separated for 30 years. What he's talking about is the presence of someone who loves you. In other words, walking into heaven is a million times better than walking out of hell because God is present. And that's what we're promised when Jesus speaks in chapter 14. An advocate, a helper, a counselor, a comforter. The Holy Spirit is with us. And so this morning as we take communion, we remember the death of Jesus Christ, but we should also celebrate the life that we gain 
through that and the advocate that is with us now and as Jesus says, forever. Let's bow for a prayer. Our Father in heaven, we're grateful for this day and for this moment to pause, <clears throat> to be cognizant of, of your presence in our life and the wonderful things that you've done for us. We pray that we live uh, according to that and then our response is one of joy and gratitude in the way that we act, the way that we treat others, uh, the way that we uh, present ourselves in this community. We ask that you'll bless our time of communion as we reflect on the life of Christ <clears throat> and his death and the life that is then uh, given to us. We pray in his name. Amen. My worth is not in what I own, not in the strength of flesh and bone, but in the costly words of love at the cross. My worth is not in skill or name, in win or lose in But in the blood of Christ that flowed at the cross, I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. I 
rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. I will trust in him, no other. My soul is satisfied in him alone. Y'all stand and sing these next two. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin, lost without hope with no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in when death was arrested and my life began. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested and my life began, oh, your grace so free washes all when death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new now life begins with you. It's your endless love pouring
God is good, amen. amen. God is good, amen. amen. Youth ministers get blamed for everything. Amen. Jay, I didn't, yeah, amen. <laughs> Jay, I didn't move this this morning. Not going to say who it was, but if you go to our video cameras on Friday night, Stephen Gerald, DJ Bulls, Ryan Welch, Clay Friddle. Don't tell them. Kyle, don't tell them, right, Kenny? Uh, Kyle, Jones, were seen entering the building, and everything was fine. And then here we are this Sunday, so it wasn't me. We're blessed. Thank you, Kenny. Thank you. Let's go to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. So we've been looking at James, and in the book of James... 
Uh, we are looking at it through the lens of trying to grow and mature in our faith. That James calls the, the readers, the listeners here to grow in their faith. That their faith would be mature, that their faith would be made perfect, that their, their faith would be complete. And that they would grow in Christ and look more and more and more like Christ. And through this last several, several weeks, we've dove into the thought of wisdom, seeking wisdom from God, and trusting that wisdom that he gives us by living that out, by carrying that out, and not doubting the wisdom that comes from God. We've, we've looked at how we deal with trials and temptations, that our trials in life can allow us to grow stronger in our faith, to lean more in on, on Christ and his walk and his ways, and that also through our temptations that we can have wisdom and discerning and seeing what God has provided for us and letting go of the things that he does not want us to partake in. And so we've walked through James with a lot of challenges. Last week, the challenge was focused in on our possessions and our money. And that there's this way in which that we can take our money and it can poison our relationship with God and our relationship with others. And so he challenged us last week in the book of James, in our money and in our finances. Today we're, we're going to skip a little bit of the end of chapter 1 and come back to that later on in this series. But I want to take us to chapter 2 this morning. So James chapter 2. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism, Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, hey, here's a seat, a good seat for you. But to the poor man, you say, sit over there, stand there, sit here on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Verse 5, listen, my dear brothers and sisters. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of whom, him to whom you belong? Verse 8, if you really keep the royal law found in Scripture... Love your neighbor as yourself. You're doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he said, you shall not commit adultery. Also said, you shall not murder. And if you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Verse 12, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So here, this week, he is dealing with this thought of favoritism. And he, and he says, point blank, favoritism is sin. It's sinful to show favoritism. And as I sat in this word, this thought of favoritism, I, I thought of how do I show favoritism? Well, I have some favorite things. I have favorite candy, almond joys. All right? I, have, I have favorite food. I have favorite sports that I like to watch or participate in. We all have favorites. There's this... A uh, group of guys, and, and our teens know them pretty well, uh, they're called Do Perfect, and they do all these different challenges with ping pong balls, basketballs, bow and arrow. They do all these different things, and they have all these different world records that they've broken, and, and they, they have this Christian-based YouTube channel that allows you to just kind of watch over all the things that they do, and they're, they're quite hilarious. And one of the things that one of the guys does is he does these top tens. 
Uh, and in his top tens, he, he picks the top ten candy or the top ten soft drinks. And he shares with the other guys what he sees to be his favorite drinks or his favorite soda. Or those are the same things, or his favorite candy. And as he's up there, he's telling them the things that he sees his favorite are, but they don't necessarily agree, but he doesn't care because he's placing them in his order from top, top ten, the number one things that he thinks is most important, the best of, of it all. And so we get this idea, we understand the concept of favoritism. Like, we have our favorites. Uh, as I look at this, I wrestle, though, with that. I wonder, okay, what, what is God really speaking through James here to me? Uh, and, and I wrestle, is, is, that, is, is, it, is it like that, having those kind of things? Or is, what about friendships? Because in all fairness, I have people that I, I desire to spend more time with. My wife is one of those. She is my favorite person in this room right now. All right? She is still back. No, she's... Sorry, babe. <laughs> really said that at a bad time. And if you know my wife, she loves attention like this, too. So I'm going to do something to ignore, you know. <laughs> that was not planned, all right? But she's my favorite person. So am I not allowed to have favorite people? Well, as I look at the life of Christ, did he have some people he spent more time with? He had his 12 that he, he was needing to be with more often. And even in that 12, he had four that he found himself, you see, interacting with more. And even in that four, he had one that he spent a whole lot of time with. Maybe not because he was his favorite. He was just a trouble causer, right? But is this what this text is talking about? Like friendships? If you look at it, he says, suppose somebody comes in here comes into your meeting. And there's talk of whether this is, this is like a, a gathering like this, or is it at a table, or, or is, was it at the synagogue? I think it fits kind of more in our context where we see today. But Jesus then gives this, this kind of story. He says, suppose, or for instance, think about this. If you're at a table, and you're hanging out, and somebody comes in and, and they're wearing these fine clothing. They have the newest style going on. And they have these gold rings that you can tell they have money. You look at them and you say, hey, this is where I think you need to see, sit down. You sit here. And to this other person who comes in, whose clothes might not be clean, whose clothes, it, it, it describes rags, that they're wearing rags. And you can have a feeling that they don't have the kind of money that the man with gold rings has. And you say, hey, you stand over here. You don't even give them a seat. You, you, you push them over to the side. Or you say, here, sit at my feet. Now, sitting at the feet, and a lot of times, it's kind of a good thing. You see, Jesus' disciples at times sitting at the feet of the rabbi. It was a place of saying, hey, I submit to you. But being placed, being placed at the feet is a different story. Willingly sitting at the feet of somebody is one thing. But having somebody put you there is a place of dominance. You're assigning status. And here, this is the wrestle in this text, that someone is, is assigning status. They are putting on the board who's most important and who's least important. And they do that by the seating chart. And as I was thinking about this, I thought of Will of Fortune. Watching Will of Fortune the other day, and it's Celebrity Week this week. We like Will of Fortune at our house. Which is surprising because I can never guess any of the right numbers and words. But Snoop Dogg was on there. And as I was watching Snoop Dogg, I'm sitting there thinking, I wonder if the other celebrities are thinking, wow, I'm playing Will of Fortune with Snoop Dogg. And then I wonder if Snoop Dogg thinks, wow, I'm on Will of Fortune and there's 
Pat Sajak and Vanna White. And I'm thinking of the celebrity world and how the celebrity world works and how there's like this, this kind of hierarchy in it. And I started thinking about the Oscars and the Grammys. And I thought, how do they figure that out? With all these celebrities who their life has been spent being shown favoritism. Like, they, they walk into the room and people notice. Not only do they notice, they're put in a high position. And I think of, like, how difficult that must be to have to organize the seating chart at the Grammys or the Oscars when everybody thinks they're the most important, but they're in a room full of important people. How, how, how big of a struggle that can be. And I promise I'm going somewhere with Snoop Dogg in my sermon. And so as I think about that, and I think about this table, there is this hierarchy that takes place that Jesus is saying. We see it in Luke chapter 14. We talked about this a couple of months ago when we talked about the church is like a table. That we see in Luke chapter 14 that these Pharisees, they come into the room and they see themselves sitting down at the table and they want to place themselves at the right spot, at the place of honor. If you go and you, you can do some research on seating charts at business meetings or corporate meetings or, or certain dinners, there are certain positions that have the seat of honor, the power chair. And it's the one to the right and the left that are the second most important. And then the one directly across it is like the chair of opposition. And so like there is a seating chart that takes place in our business meetings, in our corporates, but there's also a seating chart that takes place, we know, in our kids' lunchroom, at dinners, when we go and visit people. And here he's saying, sometimes you get wrapped up in a seating chart when you gather together. And in Luke's account of Jesus with this table, he tells them, don't, don't take the place of honor. Don't try to sit there. Take a different seat. That way you're not embarrassed if you get moved out of that place of honor. But they were desiring that seat. And as I think about this, and I think of what's going on, is that we're taking this idea of this outward show and we're putting and establishing value on it. The people here are looking at those who, who have the fine gold on their hands. And they're assigning value and status. And those who do not have the fine gold, they're assigning a lower status. And there's this concept that I've heard over the years. And it says, don't judge a book by its cover. Right? And as I think about that concept, as I think about that whole idea of don't judge a book by its cover, I, I'm, I reflect on when in Samuel, in 1 Samuel, when God says to him, says, hey, don't look at the outward appearance. Don't look at his stature. Don't look at his looks. For God doesn't see what man sees. God, God sees on the inside of people, not just on the outside. And I think of that, and I do think there's this evidence that, that God sees deep within us. And we're called to look deep within us too. But when I think of this statement, don't judge a book by its cover, I'll be honest with you, I'm a little offended. No, I'm a lot offended by that statement. And it didn't hit me till these last few years. Because when I hear that, what I'm saying is, don't judge the book, the inside of it, by its outside. I'm saying that there's a possibility that the book might not be good because I'm judging the outside to not be good. And when we're talking with people and we say, don't judge the book by its cover, what we're saying is, don't judge their inside by what they look on the outside. And to me, that's honestly kind of messed up because what we're saying is, the outside of a person isn't good, therefore the inside's not. Have you thought about it in that tense? That we're judging the outside to not be good. And here in James, when it's talking about favoritism, he says, you judge, you look, you discriminate based on your what? Your evil thoughts. Based on your evil thoughts. 
So I'm judging the outside of the book with my evil thoughts. I'm judging the outside of a person based on my own interpretation of what's valuable and what's not. And it's corrupted. And he's saying, don't do that. Don't just look at the outside of the person through your lens, through your value system. And definitely don't assign status. And as I think about this text, the reality is, is I don't always see or witness favoritism. Other people might say they see it in a moment that I did not. And more than likely, I have struggled with seeing favoritism take place because I'm on the receiving side of favoritism. That because of who I am or my status or the way I look might be on the side of where I've been shown favoritism and I can't acknowledge that favoritism is being shown because I'm sitting comfortably. There's a reality that when I notice that there's favoritism, it's because I have desired that and did not receive it. I think we struggle with this. This is the part of the text that I think we struggle with, is that we struggle with the other side of of desiring that value by by others around us. Desiring to be placed in a certain seat. Desiring to be left in a seat of honor. It felt good this morning. Felt good sitting back there and Jay thanking me. Felt good. I felt valued. I felt loved. I felt respected. But there's a point in which I can start to desire that way too much and not desiring an approval and seeking God's value system in my life. Are you with me? And so as we sit in this text, we attempt to place people in a value system that's broken, that's corrupted. We assign them status, and that means that we've treated them in a certain way. We treated them differently than others. And when we do this, one writer says, we usurp God's role in discerning who he is called to be his people, who he is called to be in his, made in his image, that we then become the ones that get to sit back and say, it is good, it is very good, versus allowing God to say, they are wonderfully and beautifully made. We desire favoritism, James says. We lose sight in verse 8. We lose sight of this royal law. The royal law. I have always heard it as the golden rule. But I'm thankful that it's, it's been translated and moved to this, this royal law versus golden rule since we're dealing with the concept of gold on people's fingers. That this law is to love your neighbors as yourself. The sin that takes place in favoritism is denying the fact that we're called to love others as we love ourselves. And when we look on judgment with others who are, who are different, who don't fit in our corrupted, evil thought mold, we forget to love our neighbor as ourselves. And when Jesus teaches this to his to the people around him, to the Pharisees earlier on, that James then brings this out of Jesus' teaching when he's faced with what is the greatest law. He says, love God and love your, love your neighbor, love others. And then the question is, who is my neighbor? And in that moment, Jesus takes this racially tension divide that's taken place where there's Jews and there's Greeks. And he says to the Jews, your neighbor is the Greek. Your neighbor is the one that looks different than you, that grew up different than you, that has different clothes than you. That's your neighbor. And so what James is saying here, it says, when we show favoritism, we do not love our neighbor as ourselves. We assign this status 
and that is sin. And then he goes on towards the end of this to start talking about sin. Some committed adultery. But he said, well, I haven't murdered. Some who've committed a murder say, well, I haven't committed adultery. And as I read this in the context of favoritism, I can't help but think we also show favoritism in sin. That we look at people's sin and we kind of categorize them. We assign status based on their sin or their past. And we say, they're this kind of person or they're this kind of person. We kind of show favoritism. There's some sins that we're a little bit more comfortable with, like going to a Chinese buffet and eating all we can eat. And then there's some sins that we turn our nose up to. And in this text here, he's saying you break one small part of the law, you're still a lawbreaker. And if you forget about the, lawyer, the royal law, the law that Christ gave us, you've broken every law. That breaking this concept of loving your neighbor through favoritism is no different than murder or adultery. And if we look at that, and we look at others outside of the context of Christ, outside of the context of mercy, it says you're going to be done with all your stuff, all your sin, without the context of mercy. But if we look at others through the context of mercy, we too receive that mercy. Jesus did not take the seat of honor. He took the seat of the cross. The seat of shame, the, the, the seat of sacrifice, the seat of submission. And I imagine others looking on him and said, wait a minute, that's our king? Wasn't he supposed to take the best seat? Wasn't he supposed to conquer? Wasn't he supposed to, to, to make all things right here and now on this earth? But there he is on the cross, crucified and shame and guilt. And as I think about that, I think of this cup that we take every week. And I'm, I'm really thankful for these cups right now. And, and I hope it becomes something that you see every, every Sunday when we take communion. Cliff, incredible thoughts this morning. And as, as others take our attention to a certain aspect of, of Christ's relationship with us and our sin, I hope this is what you see when you see this cup. Is that it is equal to everybody else's cup. It has the same amount of cracker, bread, in it. Just enough to get caught in your tooth, right? And eventually swallow. It's got the same amount of, of the juice what, that represents Christ's blood as everybody else in this room. Everybody is getting an equal take on the cup and the bread. And as I think about that and I think about this text, that should remind me that I need the same amount of Christ's love and mercy as my neighbor. And that I need to treat my neighbor with the same equality that I want to treat myself or that I want you to treat my son or my most favorite person in this world, my wife. We are all in need of God's mercy equally. And we're all called to treat one another in such view, in such manner. Comes in strong with showing favoritism. And I think he would come in strong with us desiring to be favorited too. And he wants us to remember the cross. He wants us to remember Jesus and what he did for us. This is the time where we, we sing another song and we, we have people who come down and, and different people from different backgrounds so that people here feel comfortable with sharing different things that are going on in their lives. You may be struggling with this sin of favoritism. You may be struggling with the sin of, of, of looking at others and judging them differently 
based on your corrupted view of a value system. And you may need some encouragement and some help in that. I get it. Or you may just be struggling with something else that we've been walking through with James or some kind of sin. And this is a time that you can come and do that. You may have some concerns about a family member. Coach, I got word that your brother Jimmy passed away. Is that correct? We're sorry to hear that. James Paul Myers told me just right Mariah's church was going. And this is a time for us to, to, to be mindful of those who are hurting, those we lose to as well. We offer you our condolences, Coach, and we'll be praying for you and your family. But if you have any need, and if you need to be reminded that you get to receive the cup just as equally as anybody else in here, this is the time to come as we stand and we sing. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. Miracle work. 
keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. As we dismiss, I want to read you a scripture. Now may the God of peace, who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, and ratified an eternal covenant with his blood, may he equip you with all you need for doing his will. May he produce in you through the power of Jesus Christ every good thing that is pleasing to him. All glory to him forever and ever. Amen. Have a great week.